When it comes to discussion about ripoffs, it often comes in the form of movies. From the now proven false Lion King stealing from Kimba allegations, to people saying that any animation style with an intentionally low frame rate is an automatic ripoff of Into the Spider-Verse. Ripoffs are everywhere. Case in point, about a week ago I went to a thrift shop offering DVDs for a dollar each. And wouldn't you know it, Staring at me helplessly from the shelf, I found a family four pack of movies. This pack has everything. A car's life, an ant's life, some random movie about the ugly duckling. With all of these great movies, I should be entertained for the rest of my life. I wonder why anyone would choose to give this to a thrift shop, but I'm really curious as to what this case went through. Usually DVDs just spend time on a shelf but this one almost has battle scars, with a bunch of tears on the label and casing. Despite the rips, the case is still readable. It seems these movies were published by a company called Kaboom, which is a division of another company, Phase 4 Films. However, doing even more digging, I could find that Phase 4 is actually a subsidiary of Entertainment One, a company based out of Toronto, Canada, that was bought out by Hasbro in 2019. So Hasbro, if a representative is watching, please make a Cars Life collectible toys, please. I will buy all of them. Now I also figured out that these movies movies weren't made by Kaboom, they were merely given the rights to release them in Canada, as the films were all animated by Sparkplug Entertainment, a company stemming from New York and primarily run by one man, Michael Shelp. He's a pretty wild character on his own, being the executive producer on a number of TV shows, including Mansers on Spike TV, which just sounds goofy. Have the women and children, this program is strictly for the guys. Each episode attempts to provide answers to the burning questions only men would be sophomoric enough to ponder. Clearly the pinnacle of television. This man here, Michael Shelp, is pretty much the entire creative force behind these movies, if you'd go as far as to call these films creative. He animated and wrote each and every one of these, aside from one, we'll get to that one later. More eagle-eyed viewers might have noticed that the cover says Volume 5. Well, looking at the other volumes, there seems to be a slew of these collections, but luckily, it seems I got the most interesting one. Without further ado, let's take a look at our first film in the Family 4-Pack. An Ant's Life was released sometime in 1998, the exact same year as A Bug's Life by Pixar and Ants by DreamWorks. These two films already had a bit of a rivalry, with both being about ants. Pixar higher-ups actually accused former Disney employee turned head of DreamWorks Jeffrey Katzenberg of plagiarizing their idea. While all of this is going on, none other than Michael Shelp is animating and writing this movie. And unlike with Ants, it's 100% clear that this movie is trying to jump on the bandwagon. Even the name of the film is just Ants and a Bug's Life thrown into a blender. To separate itself from the other two films, An Ants Life has a distinguished 1.3 star rating. The description reads, It's not easy being an ant. Just ask Thang. When she's not busy building an anthill for Queen Jo, Thang's saving Sal Caterpillar from the geckos or gathering seeds for her hungry sisters. Sounds like Combo Panda has some competition. So the movie begins with the aforementioned Sal Caterpillar as he's living the good life, eating a leaf. All is at peace until the geckos attacked. And it seems that the whole world has it out for this man. Sal's about to be eaten, but thankfully he runs away. <laughs> Bro, what? Why would you subject me to this, Michael? <laughs> okay, I think I'm done here. Or should I say, I fang? Okay, so the next movie is Spider's Life, A Pig's Tale. This one was released eight years later, in 2006, and- Wait! What? You haven't seen Thang. Oh, I guess I have to go back and do that. After that enthralling chase sequence, we get to meet our main characters, Thang 
and the other two I don't care about. The audio mixing is absolute garbage. Sal is a shyer character, so he talks in a quiet, whimpering tone. But because the sound wasn't mixed well at all, the background music completely overpowers it. Speaking of the music, this film just reuses the same three songs over and over again, which is really really grating. One of the ants then low-key goes on a racist tirade. I am so sick of these non-native species just waltzing in. This can mean one of 28 different things. The ants then leave Sal behind and absolutely throw it back as they leave. We then cut to a literal helicopter. This is Queen Joe. She shows up and the characters, well, do this. Then we get some dialogue between the ants. I'm Josephine. Mm. You? Huh? Mm. Mm -hmm. ah. Yes. Well, that was awkward. While the ants are busy doing that, Sal is getting chased by the geckos. But thankfully, he closes his eyes for one second and completely stops them. Stop. What? He's dead, Barry. He was moving one second ago! The ants are underground now. Cut back to Sal, and he is not eating that leaf. He meets a mantis, and that makes him fall in love or something, and now he's in a cocoon. This whole time, the ants are making an anthill, but then Fang witnesses an evil speech. Wrong species. <gasps> going to destroy them. <gasps> the we're going to destroy <gasps> them. Finally, 15 minutes into this 25 minute movie, we have our villain. <gasps> Fang gets the others and they engage in the ultimate battle. <laughs> I hate this. Sal, who's now a moth, lures geckos to murder her and her entire family and they all die. The end. While I skipped over a lot of it, so much of this movie is made up of these silent moments of the ants just walking. And while the animations look funny, don't get me wrong, when the film has to have constant filler just to hit the 25 minute mark, it shows a serious lack of skill or effort in the writing department. The animation was low quality, but it really added to the dreamlike atmosphere. Something that's truly unforgivable though is the sound design, which makes the whole thing borderline unwatchable. Mm -hmm. huh? you can help me build it. Overall, this movie is a much worse version of an actual ant's life. Short and painfully simple. I'd honestly rather watch a documentary on actual ants, as it would probably be more interesting. In real life, ants colonize and can carry stuff. Here, in this fictionalized world where they can literally do anything, they're just kind of boring. And the fact this is the shortest of the four doesn't bode well for what's to come. In Spider's Web A Pig's Tale is an animated dumpster fire made in 2006, the same year as a movie adaptation of Charlotte's Web, so it only makes sense for Michael Shelp to show up and make some money. This one's almost twice as long as the last, but that doesn't stop it from having a 1.3 star rating. So first off, it seems the animation has gotten better since last time. You know what, never mind. Then we get introduced to all the lovely animal characters. One of them is a talking yellow spider, which looks remarkably similar to the talking yellow spider in the last one. So these films can technically be in the same universe. Some French bee guy isn't pollinating, and the pig is telling him to lie about it but lying bad. That's about as deep as the messaging goes, setting up really surface level lessons for the characters to solve. Now we have even more species racism, this time against wasps. Wasps are dirty and selfish. Whoa, buddy. Weird that this is becoming a constant in these films. The pig, named Walter, seems to be a pathological liar. Okay, but the song kind of slaps them. Beneath falling leaves, the pie was vulnerable to pie-loving thieves. I also think it's important to note that the pig in Charlotte's Web is named Wilbur, by the way. So, you know. Bulls. Here. So then horses show up and do exposition. Then the spider shows up and does more exposition. These last, like, three scenes have just been exposition. When will something actually happen? <sighs> Life's not easy for anyone. <gasps> what the fuck is that? Why is it on a phone? So the spiders and snakes start arguing about whether or not lying is cool. It's not a very productive conversation. Walter then breaks a pot and continues 
just straight up lying? A thick fog rolled in, enveloping the barnyard. Hunting did begin. Emerging alone, a ghostly phantom spirit rose up from his throne. The eerie form stopped. Tiffany jumped and scared him. He ran the pot. Then his mom very unnaturally begins asking him if he did his homework. First of all, why does this literal farm animal have homework? Does it have school? I have so many questions. And secondly, guys, do you think Walter is going to lie about this? Yes. Then the pig and the snake drive a car? It's dinner time. No. <laughs> Oh, okay, what the actual f So there are aliens here now? So was Walter not lying about the pie? Aliens are a thing that canonically exist in this universe. Kids today, they have no manners. I blame video games. What?! <laughs> this movie just feels like a bunch of smaller episodes that are loosely connected by a road trip plot. Scenes blend in so much, you get deja vu on a first viewing. They go to a hotel and try to get a free room, but they mess it up and have to leave. They go to a gas station to steal gas, and it doesn't work and they leave. Then they make it to their destination where they start auditioning for theater and TV, which follows its own rigid formula of the snake lying about Walter's resume and Walter not being able to live up to the hype. Then as they leave, the snake talks shit about the business they're trying to get into. Here's a little writing tip. If the average viewer can predict what's about to happen to the word, then you're writing probably sucks. So after failing to make it in Hollywood three separate times, the snake just decides to kill Walter. He brings them to a butcher shop under the false pretenses of Walter entering the rap scene. So they have him sing his little rap song while dangling above a meat grinder. Wherever I go, whatever I do, there's one thing I know. I'll always be true to my barnyard roots. I'm from the barnyard. This is the point where every child watching this represses every memory of this movie, because man, this is pretty dark. The spiders and the bee that are also in this movie show up, and the bee stings the sleazy snake. This somehow makes him lose all sense of touch in his body, so he'll never know when he gets a phone call again, because it's not like phones have a tone when they call you or anything like a ringtone. Also, the racist bee is actually a self-hating wasp, and Walter is done with lying. All it took was a betrayal and attempted murder from his close friend. The film may be called Spider's Web A Pig's Tale, but it should probably be called Walter's Web of lies that will eat him up like the homework in that one scene. Looking at the comments section of a re-upload of the film, YouTube user Another Track Mom adamantly believes this film was created or produced by Video Brinquedo, a Brazilian company that does make ripoff films, but not this one. If I ever make a follow-up to this video, I'll talk about these guys. Seriously though, this YouTube user has been in this comment section for a full year. She has over a hundred comments on this channel, with comments as recent as yesterday. Is there really that much thrill in spreading misinformation on the internet? Either way, it's probably best to move on to our next film. A Car's Life, Sparky's Big Adventure, was also made in 2006, the same year as A Pig's Tale. You can tell because some of these sets are straight up reused between the two movies. Which makes sense, since they were probably in production at the same time. A Car's Life is one of the more well-known films by Sparkplug, and was obviously written, directed, and animated by none other than Michael Shelp. So therefore, it has a 1.2 star rating. So Sparky and his dad, who are very clear stand-ins for Lightning McQueen and Doc Hudson, are driving to an undisclosed location when Sparky floats away. <laughs> Another thing that's annoying to me is the fact that these movies use the exact same short list of reused actors. So Walter, Rose, and Sparky are all voiced by Corrine Orr. Most people watching probably didn't notice because you weren't suffering through these movies yourself. I wish I could be... Sparky, stop. This is not a musical. No, it's a gulag. <laughs> So the cars continue doing what cars do, 
and keep driving around. Apparently, speeding is a crime in this universe, so a police car starts chasing them. This is just the car equivalent of your teacher telling you not to run in the halls. So our main characters go to the Greystone of Sparky's cousin Piston, who mysteriously went missing. They leave soon enough and go to the family business, a gas station. After being introduced to the most annoying sounding character ever, yeah! Sparky refuses to take a bath. And now get in there! Child abuse! Sparky! Okay, stop pushing me, the water's too cold! Sparky. Then Diesel, Piston's former girlfriend, shows up, who smokes cigarettes? You've got to live dangerously or die trying. <laughs> Man, I sure do wonder what happened to Piston. Then yet another new character enters the scene, who tells the cast that a group of little guys stole her gas, called gas leeches. The annoying one then offers to clean her windshield, accidentally uses motor oil instead of wiper fluid, and all of a sudden she starts spinning around blind. Her eyes are down there. After that, Diesel flirts with Sparky and starts manipulating him into changing himself. First he gets decals and accessories, which in this world are more like oh, tattoos yes, and piercings. Bitch. Then she gets him to go to a movie, when he's supposed to be grounded for the aforementioned decals and accessories. Then the <gasps> gas leeches show up. Sparky wakes up, but by the time he realizes it's too late, he's stranded in the desert. He then gets towed back to the station. Diesel gaslights Sparky into wanting to go to the Badlands, some place where he isn't allowed to go, and he goes with the annoying Come one down! again. The two of them meet up with Diesel, who's ready to begin her evil plan because, yep, she was evil the whole time. That's a trend now. She uses wheel locks to restrain them. Then, <gasps> She brings in the gas leeches, which are her minions. The good thing here is that the annoying pink car dies a painful death. Sparky is also about to be destroyed, but luckily, a police car arrives and shoots a fucking rocket at her! Speedy? Huh? What? No! Then Diesel gets arrested for her heinous crimes and everyone goes home. Despite being almost twice as long as an ant's life, this one felt both longer and shorter. Like the other two, there are these pretty long moments with no dialogue, the characters just driving. But here, while not as much actually happens, I feel like there's still more going on. Of the three Shelt movies in this collection, this one was probably the best, but that isn't saying much. All of these movies roughly follow the same plot. Well-meaning child character is taken advantage of by some cartoonish evil villain, and the villain ultimately attempts to kill the child, but fails at the last second, with our hero learning their lesson at the very end. With that, we're actually done with the Shell movies, but there's still one more movie in the family four-pack. That would be... I'm ugly and I'm proud. <laughs> Okay, just to interject a little late here, I've made a very, very dear mistake. So the way I've been making this video is by watching YouTube re-uploads because I, I just don't want to plug in my DVD player. And The Ugly Duckling and Me isn't on the collection, it's actually The Ugly Duckling and Me Yard Party. A completely different, lower quality film. Considering how on the disc it says The Ugly Duckling and Me, and the part of the title that says Yard Party is completely separate from the rest of it, I'm not gonna re-review it, so just enjoy it anyways. This film is the black sheep of the collection. Michael Shelp seems to have had no involvement in making this. Also, completely coincidentally, it has a 5.4 out of 10, leagues above the ratings of Shelp's films. My best guess for its inclusion in the collection is that Kaboom, Phase 4 Films, or Entertainment One had the rights to it. According to its Wikipedia page, it actually premiered at a Toronto film festival before widespread publishing, the same location as Entertainment One. For a short while, I was debating whether or not to even talk about it. It isn't as much of a ripoff and more of an adaptation, not stealing from anything recent, but its inclusion in this collection was enough for it to be worth talking about, even if it doesn't completely match the title of the video. This one's also by far the longest of the four, clocking in at a full hour and 18 minutes, 
you know, the length of an actual film. The first thing I realized is that the animation is a lot more expressive. It still looks a little dated though. So the film starts with this Remy looking ass rat trying to swindle other rats by showing off the world's longest worm, which immediately goes bad, but there's no time for him to be sad about it since he then gets chased by a woman rat and two bigger rats. He escapes using a tie as a parachute, which doesn't make the most sense. Our main character here is Ratso. And this villain here is Phyllis. Oh yeah, I forgot this was about the ugly duckling. And me. Looking at the credits, it's nice to see that Michael Shelp is nowhere in sight. To compare, The Ugly Duckling and Me was made the same year as Spider's Web, A Pig's Tail, and A Car's Life. The only difference is that this one could actually be classified as entertainment. There is another Michael attached though, Michael Hegner. He's not too important, just the writer and creator of LEGO NINJAGO! Something I've learned to really appreciate here is the use of a moving camera, which is much more immersive than the boring static long shot of the other films. Here, the camera actually moves around. Ratso sees a ferris wheel in the distance, and, having dreams of working at the carnival, jumps off the train. He lands in a bird's nest, and, in a shocking twist of fate, an egg knocks him into an unknown location known as the Duck Yard. Out of the egg pops the title character himself, the Ugly Duckling. And he looks just like that one bird from Rio, truly a devious little guy. The birds that live there decide not to kill him, and they let him stay there to raise his weird little bird thing, who's ugly, so Ratso names him Ugly. With the pieces in place, I'm sure you can imagine where this goes. Ratso is trying to get out, all the while having to raise the duckling. His cover-up for the giant mountain of dirt is that he'll be performing a show, a show that makes enough noise to be heard by the villainous rats from earlier. For a while, I thought I could guess what would happen next. He would spend the rest of the movie adapting to life at the duckyard and ultimately learn to love his son. That's what it probably would be if it was like the others, to save on the time and budget needed for making different sets. Instead, the movie is about their journey to the carnival. Now mind you, Ratso is only taking Ugly to use as a circus attraction to be made fun of, but... So they walk through a snowy area and avoid getting eaten by a fox, because the duck is ugly. Growing up isn't something that happens overnight. The duck becomes a hormonal teenager overnight. They make it to the circus, and after a brief altercation with Phyllis, they're saved by Ratso's cousin Ernie who is a cat. But now Ratso's feeling guilty about using his own son. Throughout the course of the movie to this point, Ratso's grown attached to the duck, but this whole time it's been for the show. Now he feels genuinely guilty. He'll soon be living his dreams of entertaining a whole crowd of the same bird model, but whether it's worth it is yet to be answered. Then, at the worst moment for our heroes, with a generic hero split up after argument scene and everything, Phyllis comes in and kidnaps Ugly, setting up the climax. In a neat subversion, the rescue doesn't work and everyone is captured. Ratso is taken down a lineup of rats. And he's getting married. In another genuinely funny subversion, I never thought I'd be saying that in this video, the big villain of this film is Ratso's ex fiance who he ran away from since he didn't want to marry her. To save the day, Ugly comes in all grown up, revealing to be a swan the whole time. The end. I know I've been saying it a lot in this section, but man am I happy this isn't another spark plug movie. The film isn't great by any means, but the themes are actually suitable for kids, the animation isn't nightmare fuel, things happen in the movie, and despite being twice as long as A Car's Life, I didn't want to commit unspeakable acts of violence against myself and those around me when I was watching it. So that's always nice. So in conclusion, these movies are incredibly weird. I think that's the main takeaway from this video. Well, that, and don't show these to your kids or they'll be scarred for life. Strangely enough, it seems Michael Shelp has completely erased everything related to Sparkplug Entertainment from his resume. I wonder why. Maybe it's a tad bit embarrassing to make movies for the sole purpose of tricking someone's grandma into thinking it's the original. Or, looking at the situation with different eyes, maybe the movies were a lot more personal than I initially expected. Michael Shelp was the one man who did most of the work on each of these movies, even having his own daughter playing characters. Either way, this has been Goofy Ripoff Movies. I highly suggest not going out and watching these, but I do recommend joining my new Patreon! 
Now that I've graduated high school, I need some stability, and I'd appreciate it dearly if you can help me be a YouTuber full time. By joining, you'll gain access to my Discord server as well as additional content, extra segments of my podcast, and updates with behind the scenes information. I don't like advertising on my channel very often, but if you like this video and want to see more like it, directly supporting my work is the best way to do that. Okay, bye.